destructive. According to this, there are no whole numbers above two such that the following expression is true. x to the power of n plus y to the power of n equals z to the power of n. Shortly before Fermat died, he wrote in the margin beside this formula, I have discovered a truly remarkable proof for this, but there's no room to write it down here. Despite repeated attempts by many of the finest mathematical minds of the past three centuries, not until the 1990s has someone at last managed to find a proof for Fermat's last theorem. Even this has been disputed. For centuries, many mathematicians maintained that Fermat's last theorem couldn't possibly be true. Others, that it must be. Some are convinced that Fermat was bluffing. Still others, that he didn't dare try to prove it. Mathematics begins in certainty and ends like this. Philosophy, on the other hand, both begins and ends like this. When someone is described as having a philosophical attitude, you can be sure he's not a philosopher. This Descartes quickly discovered. After the mathematicians, it was the philosopher's turn to attack him. In no time, Descartes found himself in trouble with the church. If you could doubt everything except the fact that you were thinking, where did this leave God? Fortunately, Descartes' friends rallied to defend him, and even more fortunately, Descartes was living in Holland. Or rather, moving in Holland. In 1638, for the fifteenth time since taking up residence in the Netherlands, Descartes moved his home once again, this time to Amersfoort, just outside the ancient university city of Utrecht. By now his daughter Francine was five years old, and he was planning to send her to France so that she could become a fine lady. This book is continued on Disc 2. Descartes in 90 Minutes by Paul Strathern continued. Disc 2 Suddenly, Francine took ill and died. Descartes was devastated. It was the most bitter blow he was to suffer in his lifetime, and according to his biographer Bayer, he wept for his child with a tenderness which showed that the thought of eternity is capable of being extinguished by the grief of the moment. This tragedy occurred while Descartes was finishing his meditations, generally considered his masterpiece. Although not as immediately appealing as the Discourse on Method, it is graced with the same felicity of style, and its French is a model expression of abstract thought. Descartes gallantly claimed that he had written it with the aim of making abstract ideas exciting to women. This time he took the precaution of sending the manuscript to Father Mersenne in Paris, and asking him to circulate it so that he might discover the opinions of the learned. Descartes wished to have the approval of the scholars and the Jesuits for his new philosophical treatise, which contained an elaboration of the ideas put forward in the Discourse on Method. This time he proposes an even more comprehensive program of doubt. He imagines that the entire universe, even the truths of geometry and the winter dressing-gown he is wearing as he sits in front of the fire, may be the work of a malignant unseen being intent on deceiving him. Psychologists have confidently identified the anti-hero of this fantasy as Judge Joachim Descartes. Once again the doubtful workings of Descartes' mind arrive at the same indisputable cog, and upon this self-evident principle of ultimate certainty he once again rebuilds the universe, even going as far as to prove the existence of God with arguments first used by St. Anselm and Thomas Aquinas more than four centuries earlier, presumably in order to make the Church feel more comfortable. Although this process of Cartesian doubt was not strictly original, it was considered as such at the time. St. Augustine's remarkably similar doubts and conclusion, put forward twelve centuries earlier, were not central to his thought and had been completely ignored. But more recently, and more interestingly, the Portuguese philosopher Francisco Sanchez had proposed almost the exact same program of comprehensive doubt in his astonishing treatise Quod Nihil Sicitur why nothing can be known. This had been published sixty years before Descartes' meditations in 1581. Fortunately for Sanchez, his treatise attracted little attention, otherwise he might have ended as a great philosophic martyr at the age of thirty-one. 
Descartes had no ambitions for martyrdom, and though he possessed many of the qualifications for obscurity, under other circumstances his sloth alone would surely have qualified him, he appears to have had no ambitions in this direction either. He wanted to be heard, but he also wanted to be accepted. He was utterly convinced that he was right, but he wanted the Church to be convinced too. So under his instructions, Father Mersenne sent the manuscript of the Meditations to such luminaries of the European intellectual scene as Gassendi, Hobbes, and Arnaud, and they replied, putting forward their objections to Descartes' theories. These objections irritated Descartes, but he was persuaded to add his replies, and the Meditations were finally published in 1641, complete with objections and Descartes' rebuttals. Inevitably, the publication of Descartes' meditations provoked an even worse furor. The Jesuits correctly realized that Cartesian doubt and cogito ergo sum spelled the end of scholastic philosophy and Aquinas. Worse still for Descartes, this time the controversy spilled over into Holland. The president of the University of Utrecht accused Descartes of atheism. Ingeniously, he likened Descartes to Vanini, who had been charged with purposely putting forward weak and ineffectual proofs of the existence of God. Vanini had been burned at the stake in 1619 in Toulouse. Even more damaging attacks came from other important Dutch figures, accusing him of heresy. In those days, atheism was one thing, but heresy was a matter of mortal consequences. Fortunately, the French ambassador intervened on Descartes' behalf, and eventually the controversy waned, though for some time afterward Descartes' name and works were not allowed to be mentioned within the precincts of the University of Utrecht. Ultimately this ban was dropped after the mathematics department complained that they were unable to do geometry without making use of Cartesian coordinates. Descartes was now renowned throughout Europe, his fame stretching so far beyond the intellectual world that he was read even by royalty. When the young Queen Christina of Sweden encountered one of his books, she was so impressed that she invited him to court. He must come to Stockholm and teach her philosophy. By now the long, hard years of late rising and gentlemanly meditation were beginning to take their toll on Descartes. Although only fifty-three, he hadn't moved his home for four years. He was now living on a small estate at Egmund Bienen, twenty miles north of Amsterdam, near the sea. He did his meditations, sitting in his octagonal study, looking out over a beautiful old garden. Occasionally he would travel to Paris, where he discussed his ideas with old sparring partners like Gassendi, Pascal, Hobbes, and Arnaud. The prospect of a long trip north to Sweden did not appeal, but Queen Christina was a headstrong and determined woman. Only twenty-three years old, she had already made her mark on her kingdom. Just five feet tall, she had broad shoulders and trained like a soldier. It was said that she could gallop for more than ten hours without tiring, though one wonders about the horse. When she ascended to the throne, she vowed to turn her capital, the watery Venice of the North, into the intellectual Paris of the North. Despite her determined efforts, it remained undeniably the Stockholm of the North. Descartes was her big chance, and she was determined not to let him slip from her grasp. To reinforce her invitation, she sent an admiral and a warship to collect him, but Descartes cavilled, albeit in most gallant fashion, handing to the waiting admiral a flattering missive describing how Her Majesty was created in the image of God to a greater degree than the rest of mankind, but prayed to be excused from basking in the sunbeams of her glorious presence. Christina stamped her foot. The court had a bad day, and another ship was dispatched to fetch the immobile philosopher. Descartes, who had defeated the finest minds of Europe in intellectual argument, was forced to concede defeat. In October 1649 he sailed for Stockholm. There he was welcomed by the Queen and had two personal audiences with her. Christina appeared to have absorbed little philosophy from the study of his works, and then she found she had other matters to attend to. Descartes was left to amuse himself for six weeks, while the bitter Swedish winter set in. It was to be the worst for sixty years, the city ice-bound for six months, gloom at noon, and beyond the suburbs the wolves howling in the frigid blast beneath the aurora borealis. Midway through January, when Christina decided it was time she started her philosophy lessons, Descartes was duly summoned. 
The Queen, he was informed, would have three philosophy lessons a week, each starting at 5 a.m. Even in the army, Descartes had never risen before 11 a.m. The shock of rising at 4 a.m. in deepest Scandinavian winter, attending to his toilet with French fe-